Hello, Adult Sunday School Leader. Thank you guys so much. I've had a lot of comments, a lot of uh, emails and messages about my mom and praying for her and all that. And I appreciate that so much. She is out of ICU. She's in a regular room now. Still a little out of it. So keep praying. I do appreciate it. Well, we are continuing in the unit called Being an Authentic Church. This is the second lesson called Sharing Christ. The focal passage is out of Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, and 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. And the point of this lesson is we are to invite others into a relationship with Christ. Well, if you recall, last week's lesson's point was this. Everything in the church centers on Jesus Christ. And since this unit is on being an authentic church, every lesson title has Christ in it, except for one. That's going to be session four, which is titled Worshiping God. Well, our first set of scriptures this week, it's, it's a very familiar passage for folks who have been around the church for a while. Matthew 28. In fact, it's the last three verses in the book of Matthew. We commonly call it the Great Commission. Now, I think there are some, imp some important points here in these three familiar verses that we might overlook. First of all, Jesus states that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. This indicates a couple of characteristics about Jesus. First, it tells of his deity. He has all authority. He is sovereign. He's in control. There's nothing outside his control. Now, this statement also tells us that even though Jesus has all authority, he is also subject to the Father. This authority was given to him. Well, when Jesus declared that he had all authority, he was referencing Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, which states, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached uh, the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So in that we saw son of a uh, son of man, son of a man. And uh, you remember Jesus had many times referred to himself as the son of man. Well, on the basis of Jesus having all authority, Jesus then gave his 11 followers. Now, you got to remember Judas wasn't there at this point. And uh, we can see Matthew, just a couple of verses up, Matthew 28, verse 16. And it says the 11 that were there. He gave him just one command, make disciples. Now, the word that's translated as go, it's not a command, but it's a present participle, like going. So, as they were going, wherever they were, they were to make disciples. Not just of the Jews, but of what? All nations. Isaiah predicted that Israel would be a witness in Isaiah 43.10 and in 44 verse 8, but particularly a witness to the nations uh, when he says, a light to the Gentiles in Isaiah 42, verse 6. Now, a disciple was more than a follower. A disciple identified with their mentor, their rabbi, they, they lived with, they learned from their leader. It was kind of like being an apprentice. Jesus' initial followers, and, and now we, are to make disciples, not of ourselves, but of Jesus. And while we can't live with Jesus, we can certainly abide in him. Uh, like John 15, 4 in the King James Version says, we can abide in him. And also we can have community, we can abide with, we can have community with others who abide in him. So how does one make a disciple? Well, the first step in discipleship is conversion. It's evangelism. And as the Apostle Paul stated in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in, and how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So for someone to be converted, they must hear the message. But discipleship doesn't stop at conversion, does it? No, that's just the beginning. After a person hears the message, believes it, and are converted, then they're to be baptized. Now here's something I said in the, in the prep talk for March 5th of this year, just a few, just a few uh, weeks ago. I said this. Let's make sure our students know that a person isn't baptized in order to be saved, but a person is baptized to show they are saved. And I liken it like this uh, wedding ring. Anyone can go to a jewelry store, buy a wedding band, place it on the ring finger of their left hand, and that doesn't make them married. 
But when someone makes that personal, heartfelt commitment in a wedding ceremony and wears a wedding band, it's a public declaration of that commitment. Similarly, anyone can get dumped. They can get dumped at a river or a swimming pool or baptistry, and that doesn't make them a true follower of Christ. But when one has repented, asked for forgiveness, then baptism is like that wedding ring. It's that public declaration of a personal, heartfelt commitment. Well, did you notice that the word name in verse 19 is singular? Jesus didn't say to baptize in the names of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but in the name. To, to me, this is just another indication of the three distinct persons of the Trinity, the three, yet one. Another part of discipleship process is teaching. Now, in today's Christian culture, I think some of that comes from the pulpit. But I really believe that most of it occurs in a small group. That means that you, adult Sunday school leader, are vital. You're a vital part of the discipleship process for those in your class. That's why we should always strive to teach for life change, not just a transfer of information. Yes, you are an educator, but more than that, you're a disciple maker. One of the characteristics of God is his omnipresence. That is, he's everywhere, everywhere at once. And Jesus said he would always be with them, meaning that he too was omnipresent. Because if, if he were always with each disciple as they went their separate ways, then he definitely would be omnipresent, wouldn't he? If you look at Deuteronomy 31.6 and 31.8, as well as Joshua 1.5, you'll see that God himself said, I will never leave nor forsake you. He said that several times. Hebrews 13.5 repeats this phrase. And the, the fact that Jesus said that he would never leave them, and he mentioned uh, the Son along with the, the Father there in baptism, in the baptism formula, uh, he again, he proclaimed his deity. Now, as we look back, to Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew there quoted Isaiah 7, 14, which said that a virgin would conceive and would call him Emmanuel, which means what? It means God with us. So the Gospel of Matthew is bookended with this thought of Emmanuel. You have him being called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And at the very end of the book, Jesus says, I will always be with you. See, Jesus was physically present for 30 plus years on earth, but he's also with us forever. Well, let's go on now to our next set of scriptures, which is over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verses 16 through 19. And here Paul makes a statement that might seem a little difficult to understand when you first read it. He says, we regard no one according to the flesh. What's that about? What does that mean? Paul, it means Paul doesn't evaluate people on appearance anymore, like their race, uh, whether they're Jewish or Gentile, their gender, their age. He now sees people as God sees them, souls with one of two eternal destinies. Paul once regarded Jesus according to the flesh, that is, that outward appearance, um, because the outward appearance of Jesus would be that he was poor, you know, if, and if he were crucified, he must have meant he did something terrible, uh, maybe like blasphemy, but Paul doesn't see things like that anymore. He now realizes that Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God sent to be our Passover Lamb. And if anyone is in Christ, that is, a believer, a follower of Christ, then he or she is a new creation. And this goes right along with Paul's other writings like 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen that says, For we were all baptized by one Spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. Or Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Another one, Colossians 3.11, that says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. See, that old way of looking at people, Jew or Gentile, that's gone. The new way is now here, and, and the new way is God's way. Do you remember what we looked at uh, a few minutes ago back in Matthew, that the good news was to be for all nations and for all peoples? That's the new way. It wasn't just for Jews, but for all. And God has given everyone who's a follower of him the same ministry task. Now, he distributes different 
spiritual gifts as he sees fit, but we all have the same ministry task, that is the ministry of reconciliation. And remember that reconciling means means bringing into agreement, whether that's uh, you know you're reconciling your bank statement and you're bringing your checkbook balance into agreement with what the bank says, or when a marriage is reconciled and you bring those two parties together in agreement. The last set of uh, scriptures is the next couple of verses, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21. So uh, another thing here, also, we're, we're God's ambassadors. And you know what an ambassador is, right? It's usually it's, it's an official representative of one country to another. He or she speaks on the authority of the leader of the other country. The, uh, the foreign country serves as a base, and then they promote international relations between the two companies. They help travelers from their home country, and while they promote their home country, they must keep good relations with their host country. So you see the parallels here with an ambassador, let's say, of, of the United States to England, and one being an ambassador of God, right? Philippians 3.20 tells us that our citizenship is really in heaven. So we promote our country, which is heaven, while keeping a good relationship here on earth with unbelievers. We represent Christ to people, and we communicate to them his love, his desire for their salvation, and point people to a personal relationship by being reconciled to him. And what are the means by which we can be reconciled? Why? How can this even happen? It's found in verse 21. Now, we often think of John 3.16 as the gospel in a nutshell, and it is. But I think this verse, it could have that title just as well. Jesus, the sinless one, became sin for us. He took not only our sin, but the penalty of it, death. When, when we ask for forgiveness and accept God's free gift of salvation, we then have God's approval. We are right in his eyes because we accepted Christ's death as the payment for our sin, our sin debt. And then we are credited with the righteousness of Christ. So that's our task, our commission to be God's ambassadors wherever we go to make disciples wherever we go, to invite others into a relationship with Christ wherever we go. Next week, we're going to be looking at growing in Christ out of Colossians chapter 1. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for your prayers uh, for me and my mother. And while you're praying, don't forget to pray for and with your class. Thank you guys.